Hi, I'm Dr. Dan Priest. I am a board certified foot and ankle surgeon based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. We decided to do a series of lectures for our patients and anyone around the world who might need help with their foot and ankle problems. We're also doing this lecture series to help raise money and awareness for Operation Underground Railroad. Uh, this is an amazing group of people that was started by Tim Ballard. Um, they go around the world, they save children from child sex trafficking rings, a very real problem we face. Once these kids are found, uh, this group does an amazing job of placing them in safe, secure environments um, and taking care of their needs. This is an expensive uh, operation. It takes a lot of time and effort and money. Uh, your, uh, your donation would be fantastic at Operation Underground Railroad, OURrescue.org. And with that, let's get to our discussion for today. Okay, in a different lecture, we talked about diabetic foot um, prevention and care and monitoring. <clears throat> now we're gonna talk about, let's say you actually have a wound, now what? This is a weird model. I don't know why I have a hole in the bottom, but let's just assume that's a diabetic foot wound. Um, often they're that big, often they're crazy deep and scary, and it can make a difference how you take care of your wound, whether or not this progresses on to amputation or not. So here's a few things I've learned. <clears throat> I was trained at the VA hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah, where they do a ton of wound care. And I was also trained in the community around here, which uh, deals with its fair share of diabetic problems. And so we've learned a lot. A lot of great people have trained me. So this is, this is what I know. When you have a wound and it doesn't heal quickly, a um, couple of things to look out for. First off, I know I've said this before, get to your podiatrist before you do anything else. If it's the weekend, get to the emergency room. Do not wait. Get on antibiotics, get it looked at. Um, hours and minutes sometimes can make the difference between a simple little wound and a wound that tunnels deep, bacteria getting into bone and you losing your foot. So don't mess around, get to an emergency room quickly. I don't care if the wound's been there for months. As soon as you discover it, as soon as you realize, okay, I'm ready to do something about it, do it now. You wait over the weekend, by Monday, you might have lost your foot already. So get to it, get going. So let's say you've sought out care. Here's what you need to see happen immediately. Let's assume the foot, or, or I'm sorry, the ulcer is on the bottom of the foot, that's typical. Or it's on some place that rubs on shoes, no matter what you wear. That area, in my humble opinion, the first thing to do is offload. Offloading means we're putting some kind of thick felt uh, or foam pad around the area so that when you stand on it, the area cannot touch the ground. Now, if you use foam, um, it's gonna compress and it's not gonna do any good. So foam is fine, but it needs to be covered with felt. And I have found over the years that if the felt's not at least quarter inch thick, patient's gonna crush that down so small that it doesn't do any good. So at least quarter inch felt. A lot of times I'm doubling up that felt or tripling up that felt depending on how much the patient weighs. But you need to cover the area with felt, sticky felt. You can peel the back off of this and stick it on the foot. Sometimes I'll use um, uh, tape, pre-tape that you, you spray on that's an adhesive to help it stick. But it really comes down to uh, using something to offload so that part of the foot cannot touch the ground or if it's on the ankle or people are sleeping on their side or on the top of their foot, do something and circle it with foam or felt that's thick and robust enough that no matter how much pressure's on there, the protective layer is not going to crush down and leave that area vulnerable to touching and pressure from whatever it is, the shoe or the ground that's in the area. So offloading is key. This is a pre-made um, cut out piece of felt, which is fantastic. Uh, this is a metatarsal pad which can be used if, if it's appropriate. I do have thinner uh, horseshoe pads that are already cut out which are great. They're only 8 inch thick or uh, 3 8 inch thick so they're not going to do a whole lot. Better than nothing but you get the idea. The thicker the felt the better. One thing you have to be careful about <clears throat> is if you have a wound that's taking a long time to heal if you put felt around the area again and again and again in exactly the same position, the skin starts to come through the hole kind of in a volcano type shape and start to strangulate the skin around it and then that breaks down. So you have to be careful. You need to be creative and keep the felt moving every week, make sure it's not in the same exact position and creating an indent that's gonna cause issues on its own. So offloading, critical. I get felt in these big rolls 
Um, they're actually bigger than this. So I can cut out whatever piece, whatever shape I need to fit the foot. In theory, a lot of times I'm covering the entire bottom of the foot minus the toes with a big sheet of felt and it's cutting out just barely where the, the wound is and the same size as the wound. That gives you the best protection possible. If you put just a little dinky pad on there, sometimes it moves around and it does, just doesn't do any good. So go aggressive on the felt, that's important. Usually to accommodate that kind of offloading, you're gonna be, you're gonna be filling up your shoe, a regular shoe and there's not gonna be enough space. If you shove a foot in a shoe with that much that much offloading on the bottom, the top of the foot's gonna hit the top of the shoe and you're gonna get wounds on the toes. So typically I'll use a post-op sandal. Um, you can adjust these straps all you need, make it as, as wide and open as you need. Um, sometimes we'll add more cushion on the bottom. It's just um, very um, modifiable and uh, customizable to whatever the patient needs. So I like post-op shoes uh, to accommodate my dressings and offloading. I like to take cultures. I like to take cultures frequently. If a wound has been around for a long time, it's going to become colonized. The bacteria gets in there. It's a wet, warm, dark environment. Bacteria thrives like crazy. Fungus goes crazy. Um, so occasionally, if the wound is not progressing nicely, if it looks red, if it's smelly, if there's drainage of any kind, take a culture, take a culture frequently and see what's growing in there. Uh, there's a number of studies out there that show that heavily colonized wounds won't heal. Even though the bacteria may not be attacking and you may not have redness streaking up and the patient's sick, you may discover that the wound itself won't heal simply because there's a ton of bacteria in there. So we have to be careful with antibiotics. We've got to protect them and use them judiciously. But if a wound won't heal and you've tried everything, take a culture and see what's growing and, and treat them appropriately. Topical antibiotics are a really important topic I see patients come in from dermatology all the time who've had biopsies and there's a big hole in their leg and all they've been told is put Vaseline on it, cover it, you'll be fine. While that may be true for very healthy young people, most people need something different. Most wounds are too wet. Um, because they're so wet, the skin won't heal. Um, imagine you're in the bathtub for days, the skin turns white, starts to fall off. So that's what I see with skin. skin around wounds gets macerated, it's that wrinkly white look. And if it gets too macerated, it's never gonna heal and it's gonna die. So there's a couple of tricks that I found that help a lot. Uh, this one's called gentian violet. It's a messy, horrible substance. It's basically ink. Um, gentian violet's really good at drying out wounds and protecting the wound uh, periphery. If the wound edges look white and macerated, I like to paint with this. Sometimes I'll paint the inside of the wound with this. If it's a huge wound and there's little islands of new skin forming, this will protect it really well. Gentian violet needs to be studied better, but what I've found is it's excellent at treating fungus. If you suspect there's a fungal component to it, or even if you just think there might be, paint the thing with gentian violet, at least you get some protection from that. It's a decent antibiotic as well, so can't hurt to use. The problem with this is it'll stain everything, so use big Q-tips, use um, gloves to protect your hands, if you do get it on something you didn't want to get it on your toes, it's going to stay in forever. If it gets on your hands, uh, anything with rubbing alcohol in it or an alcohol base uh, will we'll get rid of it, no big deal, but be very careful with it. One of the best things I've ever found for wounds is called Iodazorb. Um, Iodazorb is an iodine-based gel or paste. Um, it looks really gross. It's like brown clay. What it's amazing at is that it helps get the wound environment to the right amount of moisture. It's not too wet, it's not too dry, and if there's too much fluid, it can actually absorb. That's why the name Iodosorb is, why it has that name. Um, it will help absorb extra fluid and will maintain the right environment. The other thing that's amazing about it is it'll slowly release the iodine antibiotic into the wound for what I believe is four to five days or longer if it's a drier wound. No other topical antibiotic does that. This isn't a commercial fire disorder, I don't get anything from this, but no other antibiotic does that. Neosporin, polysporin, triple antibiotic, I don't care what it is, uh, silvadine, all of those are super wet bases. They are really wet, they're gonna cause the wound to macerate, or you put it in there and it's gone within hours to a day, you know, it absorbs into the, the dressing or whatever. Um, so I'm a huge fan of Iodosorb. Check to see if they have an allergy first, but if, if you can get your hands on it, you can buy it on Amazon. It's not a prescription thing. 
If you have a wound and you can't get to a doctor or your doctor's unaware of Iodazorb, suggest it, use it, you will not regret it. I can't think of so few patients that have had problems with this and so many patients have benefited from it, it's critical. Many of my patients can't change their own dressings, they can't get to it, they're, they have back issues, they're overweight, whatever. Um, so if I have a wound, which is very frequently the case, that can't, that no one can get to it and change it every week, I'll see the patient every week and I'll pack it full of this and they do quite well. Usually not a problem. Um, even if I have home health coming out, nursing coming out, the new dressing changes for me, I still ask them to use Iozor or at least betadine or iodine or something in that family because I know it's such a great drying agent and it's going to make the wound, the wound bed a much healthier thing. So wounds, that's the key. The other critical part about wound care is you need to be cleaning the wound out deeply every week. Now you can't do this on your own. You can't just scrub and get it what you need. You need to get to a podiatrist or a wound care expert and have them with a scalpel clean that thing out. It's counterintuitive, but you need to make the wound bleed every week to get the body's attention. Sometimes the cells around the wound become what's called senescent, which means they're living but barely living. It's like they're in a coma. If they're in that state, the wound may never heal. It, it's just stuck. The body's kind of walled it off and it's not paying attention to it. So the way to break that cycle is to debris the wounds uh, with a scalpel, make them bleed. You have to be very careful. You want to clean the wound out deeply enough <clears throat> to get rid of what's called biofilm. It's a layer of tissue that's formed uh, from dead bacterial cells. The bacteria itself makes the film to protect itself. It's also full of living bacteria and uh, blood cells that have been left off and dead skin cells. That needs to go. And oftentimes you need to scrape deeply and then to the, just barely the next level to make it bleed to get, to get the body uh, to react to it as if it's a new wound and it'll heal much faster. Study after study has shown that weekly, deeply, weekly deep debridements make a huge difference. Um, and they need to be done carefully. If you get into the area and you take off living skin, you know, the barely new thin little skin that's formed, if you take that off a week, obviously you're just gonna be on a treadmill and you're never gonna get anywhere. But if you're careful and you take off the dead tissue and the unhealthy tissue and get down to a bleeding base, you're gonna speed wound healing up significantly. A couple of things to consider. If it's been a month and the wound has not made 50% improvement in depth, width, whatever, um, odds are, and several studies have shown this, that the wound's not going to heal. You're gonna be just going round and round forever and it's not gonna make a difference. So every month in your mind, every four weeks, you gotta be thinking, have we made 50% improvement? If we have, great, keep going with what you're doing. If not, you've gotta change gears. For me, I always start with cultures, I always start off with offloading. Um, if I need to, to really get crazy with offloading, I'll put my patients in a cam boot so they can't load the front of the foot, they can't push off in the forefoot where they're getting wounds. Um, this will also help with heel wounds. Um, I can build up a ton of cushion in there to offload them. So we're talking offloading, we're talking weekly debridements, cultures, we're talking the appropriate topical antibiotics, whether it's gentian violet or iodazorb. If that's not working and it's been four weeks and we're thinking, what's next? Nothing's working at all. Then we'll reach for the more advanced topical um, treatments, which are gonna be skin grafts. Now I say skin grafts, we can also call it biologics. Um, there's a whole bunch of competitors out there, but basically these are skin-like substitutes that are grown in Petri dishes. Um, they can be placed on the wound. Uh, we're talking, one of my favorites is EpiFix. Um, this is a placental type um, tissue that's been harvested and you place on the wound every week. It's probably a misnomer to call it a skin graft because it's not gonna take and grow like you'd expect this, an actual skin graft to do, but it provides a number of growth factors that stimulate healing and also a source of collagen for the body to use to, to create new skin. So the biologics are great. Epifix, Dermagraft, Aplograft are my top three. Um, they all have different characteristics to it, but essentially they all provide the same, the same um, resources and that is growth factor um, stimulus to get the wounds to heal. So those are fantastic. One of the newer products out there or services is where we take a small sample of skin from somewhere that's healthy that will heal easily we send it off to a lab, they'll take that skin and grow it out and multiply it 
five, 10, 20 time fold, um, deliver it back to us and we put it back on the patient as an actual skin graft. It's not as thick and robust as an actual skin graft, but it's fantastic and it can take. Um, and that can solve long-standing wounds that have nothing wrong with them other than they just won't heal. Um, that's a newer technology that is covered by insurance. It can be quite expensive, but it's something new and exciting out there that's been a game changer where you don't want to create a big hole in the diabetic elsewhere that's not, never going to heal. Um, right now, you can get away with a uh, square centimeter harvesting site or smaller and come out with a much bigger sheet in the end. So it's pretty pretty awesome technology. Um, there are three or four different types of wounds. I'm focusing on mainly diabetic wounds, but most of these principles apply to um, vascular lesions where wounds are forming because we don't get enough blood flow. With those and with any wound, always check vascular flow. Make sure pulses are strong, skin's pinking up easily, and if not, get to a vascular surgeon to see if they can improve the situation. One of the more common wounds I see are called venous stasis wounds. Um, usually around the ankle with a patient who has bad varicose veins, veins that are leaking. Um, these veins have one-way valves up the leg. If those valves have been compromised because of previous surgery, infection, or whatnot, um, blood clots is a common one. If they're leaking and the leg is swelling, you're gonna get this brown hemosiderin deposits around the ankle area. It looks like a tan or a tattoo or something. Usually it's no big deal, but it can break down. And what I see a lot is these wounds, it's as if a patient's having an autoimmune attack. The swelling gets out of hand, the leg gets really inflamed and irritated, and people show up in the ER and, and they're put on antibiotics immediately. That's not a mistake, but a lot of times it's not even an infection, it's just an autoimmune problem. So the best way to handle that is get the fluid out of there. We're talking tight compression wraps with several layers of ACE bandages. Um, Profor is one where you've got several layers of padding and compression. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and Unaboot's one. Uh, either way, you got to squeeze the fluid out and elevate the foot. The foot needs to be above the heart. If you can get it above the heart, the fluid will drain down. If you can do it all night, fantastic. If you go too high above the heart, it can actually act. It can actually act as a tourniquet. So you have to be careful. But just slightly above the heart, let gravity do the rest. When your feet are down below your feet, I'm sorry. When your feet are down below your heart, um, you got to rely on compression. So wraps, weekly wraps with your, your podiatrist or your lymphedema specialist or whoever can make a huge difference for venous stasis ulcers, um, as well as the rest of what we've talked about, as, as well as as far as maintaining the right moisture content with gentian violet iodosorb. Um, on top of those, I like to put very absorbent dressings. <clears throat> gauze works just fine. Um, several layers of gauze or ABD pads. Um, and then tape, I use a ton of tape so the dressings don't fall off, and that's about it. One word of caution, if a patient has really weak pulses or the skin's really fragile, if you put too much compression on that, you're gonna kill the skin wherever there's a, a prominent bone. So you have to be very careful about that. You can overdo it with compression, cause wounds elsewhere and have to deal with that. A lot of times my patients come back from home healthcare visits with their nursing staff and they put too tight of a compression on there and now we got to deal with other wounds so that's a word of caution that's wound care in a nutshell uh, if you do those things most wounds are going to heal if that doesn't work you probably should involve a plastic surgeon to talk about rotational flaps or more advanced surgical options uh, but that's usually rare and not necessary if you can do the rest of these things usually you're going to see a success keep in mind we're always doing these lectures for operation underground railroad this is the amazing group formed by Tim Ballard years ago. They travel the world uh, fighting child sex trafficking rings. They find these kids, they free them from horrible situations, put them in new areas and new places where they're gonna be safe. And that's an expensive procedure. That's an expensive operation and they need your effort and your time and your money. So volunteer, make a donation to Operation Underground Railroad. That's O-U-R-Rescue.org and you will make a difference, I promise. Have a good one. Thank you.